All right. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you today our speaker, Julie Tesh. She's the president and CEO of the Center for Rural Policy and Development. Um, she is an experienced nonprofit executive specializing in agriculture, education, and rural development. She grew up on her family's dairy farm in southern Minnesota and was actively involved in 4-H over the years. After she graduated from the University of Minnesota with degrees in applied economics and agricultural education, she started her career as a 4-H youth development educator in her home county of Wasika. During her time in Wasika County, she was able to help youth realize their potential through 4-H. After her time there, she went on to work in um, agricultural education at the University of Minnesota, the National <clears throat> FFA Organization in Indianapolis, and the American Farm Bureau Foundation in Washington, D.C. She returned to her home farm in 2017 after realizing that she valued her connections and life in rural Minnesota. She currently is the president and CEO of the Center for Rural Policy and Development, where she gets to promote rural policy issues through non-biased research. And outside of work, you can find Julie volunteering for 4-H and FFA programs. And uh, she likes to do gardening. And honestly, if, if I can say as a, a former colleague basically is she is always there. Whatever happens in this world of rural and agriculture, Julie is there and is a true leader. So with that, uh, please help me welcome Julie. Thank you very much, Olga. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's kind of funny how one does end up being everywhere, but it's it's the people, you know, it's the, the people that you get to meet and uh, wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm going to share my screen here and I, I'm actually happy that it's a small group. Um, I find, you know, asking questions afterwards is a lot easier, but I'm just going to, let's see here. It's been a while since I've been on this side of things. I don't know about you all, but we're used to using Zoom for our work, but I work a lot with the state departments in Minnesota and they all use Teams. And I, I, I teams. can't I handle teams. teams. I Federal can't. Federal government my, as my, well. My it team. drives me insane. Oh, I, I swear the I Microsoft it. must have like the biggest contract with the U.S. government and state governments. Agreed. <laughs> Yeah, so I was really happy that this was a Zoom. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. I actually know how to run um, <laughs> run this. So I, I kept this really broad and open because I know that we have people from different parts of you know, the Midwest here. And so just want to talk a little bit about the future of rural Minnesota. And the first thing whenever I talk to people is I always ask them, what is your rural? Because people have different definitions of what they think rural is. And so really thinking about, you know, where, where I live on our family's farm, the closest town to me is 201 people. I think we can all agree that's rural. Now, <laughs> if you go to Mankato, which is the, a regional center by us, the people who live there don't think it's rural. But you go to the Twin Cities, and if you ask people like, oh, what do you think Mankato is? Is it rural or urban? They're going to say rural. And Elka, I'm sure you'll find out in DC when I lived out there, I was happy that people could find Minnesota on a map, much less Minneapolis. You know, um, it, it's, it's all relative, right? And so it, it, it's all relative. So I always like to just always ask people, what is your rural? And what do you mean by that? Because you'll see here, let me, so just by looking through the, <laughs> talking about the federal government, there's a lot of different definitions. There's actually 15 different definitions for rural in the federal government, depending upon what department you're dealing with, whether it's ag or commerce, economic development. Um, but here's a couple explanations or, um, definitions of rural. Fewer than 50,000 inhabitants and not located adjacent to an urban area. Okay. 
any place outside a town, city, or urban cluster with more than 2,500 residents, okay, 20,000 or fewer inhabitants, 10,000 or fewer inhabitants, 5,000 and fewer, and any place determined by a state government to be rural. So have at it. You know, what, what do you want your rural to be? And so, um, like I said, I always like to remind people of that because what one person thinks of rural, the other person doesn't. We just had a board meeting in Moorhead, Minnesota last week, so up in the northern part of the state. And the Fargo-Moorhead area is, is an urban area. But in the grand scheme of things, we call it greater Minnesota, so outside of the metro area. And people think that it's rural. Well, depending upon the definition, it is definitely urban. Um, oh, and then, yes, and then here's the best one. Any place that's not in a town or city with more than 2,500 residents. So you have anything from under 2,500 residents up to 50,000. So take your pick. It's all perspective. So, you know, leave it to the federal government to make it confusing. So, and, and so that comes into, into play, especially when you're applying for grants federal grants because the depart the Commerce Department will have very different standards for your population if you're considered rural. And then the Department of Ag has different considerations and Health and Human Services has different. And so it's all, it's one thing my town of 201, they will always qualify more than likely, but you start getting into the, the town here in Wasika where I'm a member of Rotary, they have just under 10,000 people. And depending upon what map you look at, they're urban and they're rural. But this is a rural county. And so it's always interesting how that happens. Um, and, and talking to you again about why, why does it matter? Who, who cares? Um, so depending upon how you look at it, the share of the US population considered rural inhabitants ranges from 17 to 49%. So people talk about, oh, it's a small portion of people that live in rural areas, but is it? It can be up to half the people, depending upon how you look at it. Um, the oversimplification ignores the diversity of experiences among rural people. In our organization, the Center for Rural Policy and Development, we're always talking about, and it's in our new strategic plan, helping people realize that rural is not a monolith. Rural is not one thing. We like to say, if you've been to one rural town, you've been to one rural town. Um, they're all different. And there's a lot of diversity and there's a lot of, a lot of things happening in rural, but people gloss over it a lot. And so the oversimplification really pigeonholes rural places. Um, the population growth in non-metro counties is often represented as decline because many of the fastest growing non-metro counties have been redefined as metro. So basically I'll use the example of, I don't know, I know Olga you're familiar and Elka too probably, but like one of like a suburban county outside of Minneapolis. So let's say um, Harvard County. And so, it was considered rural several years ago and now it's kind of suburban a little bit. But when you go and you change the maps, it looks like rural population has decreased when in fact, the ur they're now considered urban. So it's a carve out. So it's not apples to, it's not apples, to apples. It's, it's different measures. And so it, it, I'll show you that on a map here in a little bit. But the bottom line is that for today in rural America, the co chronic population decline in, or depopulation, as I like to call it, is a product of our own success. These exurban areas are growing exponentially and they're no longer rural. They're urban. And so therefore, or rural must be declining. No, they're just getting classified differently. Um, I want to talk to you quickly about how Minnesota has changed over time. And we're a state organization, but I am going to guess that this is fairly uh, accurate for the region, for the Midwest region, I would say, especially Wisconsin. We compare a lot of our data there as well. Um, but you can see here um, this map where the dark blue is. Those are all areas considered 
urban. So you have the Twin Cities, St. Cloud, Mankato, Rochester, but the majority of the land is rural. Now do the people, where are the people in rural? Good question. So I uh, put a little levity into here so, to talk about changes and how things rural has changed. This is me, uh, born in 1975. Um, the population of Minnesota was 3.9 million people in 1975. And the, pop the US population was 219 million. And so I'll be using these numbers a little bit here. Um, 56.9 million were, is the US rural population and the global population was 4 billion. And Gerald Ford was the president. So you think about that, that, I mean, that's a lot, but you think of what we have now. And then just for fun, I, I always like to put in here, I'm like the Vietnam War ended in 1975. The Wheel of Fortune debuts, which I just watched The Wheel of Fortune with my 92-year-old grandmother at the nursing home. So, yay, Wheel of Fortune. Um, Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen Rosalise and Saturday Night Live. So that's 1975. Compared to 2022, so if you see here, the population boom. So population of Minnesota 5.7 compared to 3.9. What I want to show you is obviously the U.S. population has increased. But the rural population you see in 1975 is 56.9. The U.S. the population rural population in 2022 is 56.8. Mm -hmm. So it shifts, it ebbs and flows. So it's the same population, but we have so many more people living in urban areas that it we have a smaller proportion. If that makes sense. Um, and also just for fun too, you know, last year Top Gun Maverick was released. All the 90s fashion is back, which I laugh about. Um, yeah, Queen Elizabeth and average income, but, and Joe Biden is president. So again, population boom, 4 billion global population to now 7.9 billion, almost double. But we have the same rural population in, U in the USA. When our organization, actually I should back up here a little bit. Um, so our center, we were created in 1997 by the state of Minnesota. And to basically look at research or to look at policy from a, a research or from a, a rural angle, because there's a lot of nuance that should happen in good policy making. Um, as we all know, there's a lot of nuance that does not happen. And so our reports really try seek to inform decision makers. Our main audience is legislators, but more and more our audience are county commissioners, city council members, county administrators, regional people that are using our research to be able to either apply for grants, um, testify at the legislature or at the national level, because we specifically focus on rural. So an example I like to use is talking about rural health care. And rural health care in Minneapolis, St. Paul looks very different than rural health care in, um, well, anywhere in rural almost. You know, and so we, we try to help people understand the differences. It's not that it's good or bad, but that there's differences. But we also have some shared characteristics as well. And so a main issue in rural areas for rural health care is access. And by access, we're talking about being able to physically get to a clinic. Where in an urban area, access means something different. And so, um, you know, the average time for somebody, if you have to go see a cardiologist in certain parts of Minnesota is two hours. Or in the Twin Cities, you can get to somebody rather quickly, but do they have access through insurance? There's other barriers. And so ours in rural Minnesota for healthcare are very basic things that people forget about. And so that's where our research comes in and says, well, now if you take away um, the birth center in Albert Lee in Southern Minnesota, what does that mean for families? They're going to have to drive an extra half hour or hour to have their baby. What does that mean in a rural area? And so that, again, that's where we come in and bring up that information because 
decision makers are busy. They have a lot to deal with and they just gloss over, yep, this will be good for everyone. Well, it's not. And especially when you're talking about technology, I am actually sitting here at my aunt's place in Waseca right now, <clears throat> excuse me, because out on our farm, our internet is not great. Um, I can do email there and, and do most things, but whenever I do webinars, I come into town and, and do things because she has solid internet. And so if you talk about telehealth, you know, my 92 year old grandmother that lived at home, home until last week, she was not going to get on her computer. She didn't have a computer to do, you know, an appointment at the doctor. And so we bring in those, those nuances and help people realize that. And the other thing too, is we help people realize that we do have a lot more in common than we think. There is a lot, when you start uncovering data in rural, there is a lot more in common with, with like inner city, Minneapolis and St. Paul than most realize. Um, because they're more overlooked populations, they're more um, more poor, they just have a lot of different uh, similarities. Awesome. So when we're talking about rural, you know, like I was just saying, it's like, oh, it's, it's shrinking, it's dying. And that is not the case. Now, in some places, absolutely, yes. There are some places in Minnesota and in rural areas, yes, it is, it is shrinking. But our research shows here in rural in Minnesota, we have, we have three population growth areas and that's counties that are considered recreational. So if you're looking at the Brainerd Lakes area, so the central lakes, if there's lakes and of course land of 10,000 lakes, that's where population is growing, especially after COVID, um, people who could afford to move to their lake homes um, or did things like that. So that area in Brainerd, that central part of the state has really been growing. Another area that's been growing are the counties where the non-white populations are concentrated. And this is typically where meat packing facilities and the vegetable processing facilities are located. So Nobles County, which is Worthington, and then Maurer County, which is Austin, that's the home of Hormel. Their non-white populations um, are through the roof. Actually at the, I don't have the exact statistic in my head, but at the Worthington High School, I do know there are more non-white students than white students at the high school and the the number of languages spoken is fantastic and so it communities are having to figure out how to welcome and work with different populations because quite honestly if we didn't have these immigrant populations we couldn't keep these facilities open there's just no way and so um certain towns are starting to realize that um because there is some animosity and anger of course towards some immigrant and refugee populations, but once they realize that we wouldn't have a town without immigrant and refugee populations, their tune changes really quickly. So we are seeing areas grow there. And then what we consider the metropolitan counties. So uh, Blue Earth is Mankato, Olmstead, Rochester, um, and then Clay County is up in Moorhead. So those are regional areas. And I know in Mankato, that is our closest regional hub. I live about 25 miles from there. The growth there is phenomenal. The housing is on fire. But then you come to our town of Wasika, and it's pretty stagnant. And so it's very specific around the state, very compartmentalized. You probably maybe have heard of the brain drain. Not sure or not, but we have something called the brain drain, and that is called. 18 year olds graduating high school and going and doing living life. That's what they do. Um, in rural areas, we see that more often. And it, a lot of times they don't come back. And so there's a lot of hand wringing and what should we do? We need to work on keeping our kids here. But I look at it in a different angle because I'm one of those that left and I came back 25 years later. And I'm glad I left because I got to learn about the world and meet new people and come back and share that with people at home. But the brain drain, people get so caught on that narrative, like everyone's leaving. And I have, a, you know, I, I, I can tell you that 18 year olds in Minneapolis and St. Paul leave as well. You know, 18 year olds in New York City leave. 
they all leave, but why don't we give them something to come back to? And so what our research is finding and the University of Minnesota Extension Services is finding is that we're actually having a brain gain. So from the ages of 30 to 49, more people are moving to a rural area because they want to settle down. They want affordable housing, a slower pace of life, jobs. It, they're gaining more people. And we do have the data now after the pandemic that rural did grow a little bit. We'll see if that's sustainable. Um, I think rural would have grown even more and will grow even more, but we have major issues with housing, childcare. We don't have adequate childcare. We don't have adequate housing. Um, we just haven't kept up on the infrastructure in rural areas. So you'll see here, these are the returning 30 to 49 year olds. Um, and among all rural counties, they all experience an out migration. That's what happened. You know, you look in the, you look at the red there. Um, on the left, yeah, that's where people, I went to St. Paul. I lived in St. Paul for 15 years. That's what you do. But then you start going into the 30 and 34 year old cohort. People are starting to move into these blue areas, into these greater Minnesota areas. And so a lot of it is narrative. You know, rural is dying. And again, in certain instances, yes. But as a whole, rural Minnesota is really holding its own. And part of that is because of the diversification of our economy, because we don't rely just on agriculture. You know, manufacturing is huge, medical, um, food processing. We have those things. So when somebody has takes a hit in the economy, typically there's another um, area that can sustain that economic downturn. And I really like this. Um, this chart or this graph from Growth and Justice, because you can see here the percent uh, people of color, 1980, 2010, and 2040. And we often get a bad rap in rural areas because, you know, we're not diverse, we're not open minded, we're all this and that. And I like to challenge people and say, look at this map, but then also look at um, census data because. A lot of our rural areas, again, where we have meat packing, vegetable processing, where we have these factories, their areas are more diverse than urban areas. So you go to Austin, Minnesota, you're going to hear just as many foreign languages spoken, if not more, there than in Minneapolis. Same for Worthington or Elbow Lake, wherever that is. Because once people know that there's jobs, then families will move there. And so, again, rural isn't a monolith. It really depends upon where you live. Um, here in Waseca, where I'm from, the county I'm from, 20 years ago when I was doing 4-H, um, we started an after-school 4-H club for Latino youth. The sole reason being to get the kids and their families comfortable going to the school because typically what happened is they would reach eighth grade and the kids would quit school to go work. And there were a number of us in the community that thought that these kids need an education. What can we do? And so just getting parents comfortable coming to a school and the kids comfortable coming to school. And, you know, now here 20 years later, I'm not saying that the after school program caused this or anything, but it was at least a nice start. But you know, we have a lot more diversity. We have a, a, gosh, I don't even know how many languages are spoken in Wasika, but things are coming along really well, but people just don't think about that. Um, <laughs> when you think about it, talking about economic vitality, so manufacturing, agriculture, processing, each county in the state has to have their government workers. You need to have public health. You need to have sheriff. You need to have uh, maintenance, transportation. So rural areas actually have a higher percentage of workers employed in government than others, but also as entrepreneurs. You know, we have like this fierce independent streak in rural areas. So we have a higher percentage of those employed in government and as entrepreneurs, which I think is pretty cool. And like I've mentioned before, you know, the top industries um, 
in Minnesota right now for employment are education and health services, um, farm employment, leisure and hospitality, so that's all the tourism, manufacturing, and then trade, transportation, and utilities. And like I said, when one, you know, when the ag economy maybe goes south, you know, maybe sometimes um, trade and transportation will, will bump up. I know during COVID, the leisure and hospitality area took a huge, 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 huge hit in the central part of the state. But there were other, other industries in the Brainerd Lakes area that could help supplement that to make sure that it wasn't a complete loss. The, the one thing that I'll say is consistent through all of these industries, and I know this will be no surprise to any of you, is workforce. Trying to find workers, I don't care if you're in urban, if you're in rural, suburban, trying to find workers is really, really difficult. And what are we gonna do? You know, that's a, that's a conversation we have quite a bit. And one of the things that, um, one of the things that we talk about quite often is, and this is again for rural Minnesota, we need to quit talking about we need jobs, jobs, jobs. We don't need jobs. We have, we have too many jobs already. Not too many. We don't have, we don't need, we don't have people. What we need is people. We need tactics for getting people to move to rural areas. We have, the, we have the jobs. We have every level of job you could ever want. We need the people to move here bottom line. And so it is like turning a ship to trying to get people, especially government and even business to shift to say, no, you know, you, you may think you're being helpful by bringing a, uh, a 3M having a plant in XYZ town. Right. But then there's going to be this place there. People will go work for 3M, but then there's these other industries that have that don't have people working as well. So it's kind of a domino effect. And so trying to help people understand we have jobs. They're there. We need the people. But then with that, we need the housing. We need the health care. We need the child care. Um, so what does this mean? And I'm going to end with this, but it, changing the rural narrative, that's really what all of this is about is changing that narrative, but then for our organization is being an advocate for rural as well. Um, we're non-biased, non-partisan, but all we do is rural research. And so um, some of the reports, a report that has really stuck with people in the last year is rural EMS, so emergency medical services. So if I call 911, is somebody going to show up in a rural area? And I know for me, if I call 911, it'll, I might have first responders out there, but I won't get an ambulance there for half hour. You know, minutes count. And so talk about workforce, there's a huge lack of workforce because so many of those people are volunteers. Um, a report we have coming out here in the future in November, actually on November 14th, is um, on migration patterns of students in Southwest Minnesota. And we have been able to work with the Office of Higher Education in Minnesota. And it's crazy how you can track people. I mean, it's kind of scary. But students, I forget the exact year, maybe 2009, but students in high school at the time, we can track them and see if they left the state or not. So say they left the state and went to South Dakota. Everybody's going to South Dakota. Everybody. They've got a, hard, a full court press on Minnesota trying to get students to come and it's working, but then we're able to tell, do they come back? And so our research has found that it's not great news. Um, most of the students that do leave do stay away, but the glimmers of hope are if you take a career in tech ed class, so, um, you know, industrial tech, agriculture, um, things like that, you're more prone to stay in the region. And then also if you go to a community and technical college, you're more apt to stay in the area. And so that's what we're really focusing on is hoping to lift up the community and technical colleges. Um, and then another one that we have coming out will be on rural mental health. And this is something we're partnering with our Center for Rural Behavioral Health at Minnesota State University, Mankato. 
and we did a couple reports last year, but the one that we'll be uh, putting out this year is we're calling it Deaths of Despair. And so it, it's, it's a rough topic. It's suicide, it's addiction, it's overdose, but talking about in a rural sense, what does that mean? And what does that access look like? And so um, we're excited to have those reports come out because what we're finding out is that our research is helping to springboard the conversation to get the conversation started. So rural EMS, people were not talking about the lack of EMS in rural areas until we put this report out. So it's nice that we can be that advocate and be that, you know, that organization that can put that out there and we're relied upon. Um, if you're interested in keeping up with us on social media, you can see here we're on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, whenever we release a report, we do a webinar and it is recorded. And so all of our webinars are on YouTube. So you can take a look. And so we, we go through the research, but then we typically have a panel discussion diving in even more. Um, and then we also have um, a newsletter that comes out. I have not been very good about that in the last few months, um, but we do have a newsletter. And so if you sign up for this, you'll be the first ones to know about our most recent research. We're going to be starting to do more events in person. So that's great. So you'll be the first to know of everything that's going on. Um, and with that, I guess I'll say thank you. And like I said, that was just a quick overview and I'm gonna stop sharing here. Very quick overview. I could talk for ages on all the different topics, but that that is just a quick overview of rural Minnesota and the kind of the things that we look at. So I guess questions. Comments, concerns. I see Marcia has a question, but you're on mute. Thank you, Julie. Mm -hmm. That is a um, lot. Just as a, mm -hmm. a rural, you know, Nebraska and uh, Kansas, and I don't think there is a lot of uniqueness between some of the Midwest states. A lot of what you said applies. My hometown was 300 people. <laughs> I can probably count on one hand the towns in Nebraska that are over 50,000. So I think that I'm sure that you guys, uh, you know, join forces with other states because there's similar challenges. Absolutely. And yeah, absolutely. We do. And it's like I said, we, we talk a lot with colleagues from Wisconsin, some from Iowa, some from South Dakota, but you know, you look at South Dakota and they, South Dakota's got it going on. They are booming. Huh. And it, it is, you know, they don't have income tax. Um, they're, they are doing a really good job of recruiting students. Um, and that's something with this report coming out in November on workforce in Southwest Minnesota, we're, we're focusing on is how, how can, higher education do a better job of keeping our students, not just in the region, but in the state. You know, there, there's a program in South Dakota called Build Dakota, and I'm Olga, I'm sure you know about that, um, where you don't have to be from South Dakota. I have a friend from Minnesota. Her son is going to be a, a diesel mechanic. He's at Watertown at a community and technical college. He applied for this program, got accepted, he has his schooling all paid for. He has his internships already. He has them and he has a job waiting for him after college. And he lives in Worthington, Minnesota. That's all, they lay it all out for you. How can you say no, you know, to something like oh. that? And so it's, they've got, South Dakota's got some really good strategy and, and we're just trying to play cat. We're just, not even playing catch up. We're just trying to figure out what's going on. You know, I live in the Southern part of the state and I get, I think I've gotten three or four glo big glossy postcards from the governor of South Dakota. I mean, they're oh. actively recruiting. Yeah. Christy Noam is on yeah. these postcards being a, a dental hygienist, a welder. All this, and they, and they do a wonderful job of saying, oh, starting salaries at $70,000, no income tax, this and this. I mean, they're, they're hitting the mark. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Wow. I'm curious what your thoughts are kind of on that same note is, although, well, I anecdotally, I know of a few people who during COVID moved out of Minneapolis mm-hmm. into rural Minnesota. And last mm-hmm. I heard they were still living out there with the remote jobs and were really happy with like the smaller towns for raising their kids. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that or if there were any drawbacks for local communities in terms of rising housing costs or if, you know, if because of the urban exodus, maybe it wasn't enough to be an exodus, but this like movement, are people in rural Minnesota now looking at like North Dakota because little towns mm-hmm. in Minnesota are too expensive? Good question. No, that's a really good question. You know, the numbers showed us that there there was an out migration from the Twin Cities. It was the first time, and I forget how long, that there was more people moving out of Ramsey and Hennepin County than moving in. But we really attribute that to COVID. I'm curious to see how that plays out. Because like you said, now we have people, some people did move out and the housing prices here are they're expensive now. I mean, one of the benefits you could always tout about living in rural areas was the cost of living is less. And sure, it might be less, but our salaries too sometimes are less. And so, you know, I'm looking to buy a house here in the Wasika area and the average person can't, you know, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not buying a $500,000 house. And that house was just $300,000 two years ago, mm-hmm. you know, and so that economy is hitting everywhere. And so it, yeah, it, I, I'm curious to see what the trend is. You know, the people that I, I, anecdotally, the people that I know that did leave urban areas for rural area do like it. But again, I think there would have been more people, but we just did not have the infrastructure ready. We don't, we don't have the housing. Um, we don't have the infrastructure, but we'll see. But it, it's, it's expensive, very expensive. Um, you know, just talking about food, you know, we're, um, I hosted a journalist out at our farm last fall. We went to my little town and she looks around and she's like, is this a food desert? I'm like, it is actually, you know, I'm like, we're surrounded by corn and soybeans, but we do not have a grocery store in town. We don't, we don't, the only thing you can get to eat in town is to go to the bar and get a pizza. <laughs> you know, that's it. You can get lottery tickets, smoke, Mountain Dew and booze and pizza, but that's the only thing, but it's, it's a food desert. So we're surrounded by agriculture, but it's a food desert. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's just a weird situation, but Elka, like you said, it, the prices are going up in my little town of Waldorf. You could typically get a decent house for, I mean, a hundred thousand dollars. Now they're over 200 and people in our area can't afford that. They just can't. And so, but the interesting thing is that homes are all full. So there mm-hmm. are outside forces. People are moving in, but then the displaced people, what do they do? And so we're really trying to figure out affordable housing and workforce housing because these small towns, we just don't, we don't have it. It makes me really see the parallels to inner city or more mm-hmm. communities of color in um, urban areas with gentrification. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I wonder if like down the line is like the charm that draws people there. Well, like that charm all comes from a local population that might be priced out and we'll have to leave in five yep. years and then you're going to have you know and then it won't feel the same right or the people who actually like work the grocery or work maybe not the grocery store mm-hmm. but the gas station or that bar yeah. or teach in the schools are going to have to be commuting you know 30 45 minutes because they can yep. only no longer afford and then it's not the community that they b- thought they were buying into um yep so yeah no it, and, and it's fascinating when you dig into it the similarities i mean between inner city and, and very rural, they run parallel to each other. They're so similar in the disparities, you know, whether it's education or technology, you know, you always hear about rural doesn't have, certain places in rural don't, doesn't have good internet. Well, there's places in Minneapolis and St. Paul that their internet's awful too. You know, it's not just rural. And so it, there's a lot, they, they share a lot of the same disparities. 
Hmm. Thanks. That gives me a lot to think on. I hadn't really like ever really truly connected those two. So um, I'm excited to sit on it more. No, I, I, I hear you. I didn't really think about it until I got into this, into this world. And I'm like, huh, that's fascinating because it's systems, right? I mean, it's all the systems of government, systems of business. And we actually, um, if you sign up for our, our newsletter, or even if you don't, you can go on our YouTube channel. We're partnering with an organization called the Citizens League. And we're, we host discussions called Interconnected. And so Citizens League is a statewide Minnesota organization, but they're more urban focused. And so uh, we bring in our rural reports and we talk about the similarities and differences between a topic. So if it's childcare, um, we're doing one on mental health, you know, just access. So what are the similarities and differences? And we've, this will be the third year we've done that. And you can see those previous ones on our YouTube channel. And there's a lot of great learning that I know I do, but I know a lot of people just realizing, oh, I didn't realize this was an issue here or that we share this. And so we try to tackle those topics. So it's, it, you know, the more we can talk with each other and, and realize our similarities and differences, the, you know, the better off we'll be. But it's, it's hard <laughs> getting people to talk sometimes. Totally. I am curious, so Kirk is um, on the EMT in St. Croix Falls, mm. right? How did this sound to you? The, the, how far do you drive with your ambulance and how does that go? Um, so Polk County, where I live, has about 45,000 people. And we have... Um, five or six different bases for for the county. If one of those ambulances is um, on a call, then they'll go to the next nearest base. And so generally you're going um, 10 to 15 miles, but um, you might be going across the county if there's a major accident or if that particular ambulance is out of service because there's a lot of shortages on the um, on the EMS front where we just don't have enough paramedics or EMTs to run the ambulance, and so they'll call, you know, from 20 miles away. Uh, it, it you could even we've called from like outside of the county if it's a a major incident. So yeah, it's it's not typical that that happens, but from time to time uh, we do get called from a, a quite a distance and i'll say in our rural areas it you know when we have that brain drain people young people leaving getting them to come back and then trying to get them involved in the community as quick as possible um it's a little more difficult because you know they, they're established they want to do their things but we need those people to be on EMS. We need volunteer firefighters. We need city council people. We need all of them. And now it's it's time for that generation to step up and my generation to step up. And so, um, yeah, it's more difficult finding that and thinking about EMS and volunteer like fire department. Um, employers just don't understand that anymore before it was oh yeah you know you're working for uh whatever in town and totally you're on call you get called out go where now you don't they might not let you do that and so it's it's a real problem and so um depending upon the area you're in it's uh it can be a real a real uh hassle and people it's one of those things People won't care about it until their 911 call doesn't get answered, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, and a lot of it is just federal funding. The funding formula hasn't been changed since I believe the eighties. And so um, there's so many issues. It's not just a state of Minnesota issue. It is a national issue because EMS is treated like a transportation service and not healthcare because you only get reimbursed if you take somebody to the ER. So 
my grandma who fell, they came and helped her out. They don't get reimbursed. They didn't take her anywhere, mm-hmm. you know? So it, it, it's, it's a system. It's a huge system issue. Yeah. I, I, um, <laughs> I wear several hats. So I'm also the mayor in St. Croix Falls. And yeah. we pay the fire department um, when we go on calls and my text airs, my text uh, money pays for the EMS. And it's very, um, it's very normal for them to really request that you go to the ER with them when really there's no reason to do that. And so I will, I will hint towards them to say, you don't have to go with them. It is completely legitimate for you to get in your car or walk across the street to the clinic and go to the ER um, because people don't pay uh, many times because of their um, government insurance or, or whatever. They don't feel the pain of, of the bill. They're willing to take an ambulance ride for a sliver or because, you know, they have a, a stiffly nose <laughs> and it's, you know, there's many times we've been literally across the street from the ER. You could see it from their door. And it's like, can we just walk you across <laughs> and save you 2,500 bucks? Uh, but right. yeah, people, people opt to go in the ambulance um, or would rather die than have to do that bill. <laughs> um, <laughs> and in rural yeah. areas where we're an hour from regions in St. Paul, which is our level one trauma center, um, air care is a huge deal. And so if there's a bad accident, we auto launch a helicopter to the scene or to the local hospital and they take that patient to regions or to the U of M or wherever they may go. And that is a 35 to $45,000 bill and insurance doesn't cover that. So that's unless you have helicopter insurance. So that's another problem with being out here. You don't want to have a heart attack because we don't have a cath lab within 50 miles and right. a helicopter. So yeah, no, don't have strokes or heli- or heart attacks in rural areas because there's nowhere to yeah, get Don't bit. do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so true. Yeah. My, you might as well move to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. There's no stress there, so you wouldn't even have a heart attack. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Who needs? Yeah. yeah. Um, um, so good. If I look at the clock, we have come to our time. Is there anything, any last um, words or thoughts that anyone would like to share before we wrap it up? Great program, Julie. Thank you. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I know, I know it's like a fire hose of information, but it <laughs> so th- thank you for inviting me all I greatly appreciate it and, and enjoying getting involved in rotary so I'll be excited to tell my fellow rotarians here in Wasika about meeting with you all Julie would you mind just popping in either in the chat either the website or just sharing it right now so I can oh, pull yeah. it up on the computer here in the background I missed it when I was listening to you earlier but either like a website oh, yeah, here, I'll pull it up. page or wherever is easiest for me to go yeah. that's a good idea okay yeah Good so idea. Yeah, pearlmn.org. That's our Pearl website. Minnesota. You'll be able to get everything on there. And we have podcasts and blogs. So well, it seems got like the a whole great gamut. way to stay connected to Minnesota as well. Yeah. Because I, I love Minnesota and our like semi, I mean, our like mix of Minneapolis and up north and the farms out, you know, like I just, I, I think it's a great state and rural Minnesota is a large part of that. So yep. awesome. Yeah. Please stay connected. Absolutely. Thank you so much for informing us and educating us and making us aware of things that honestly, I thought I was pretty educated on the topic, but I learned a lot too. So thank you very much. And um, I love to stay in touch. And then um, uh, if you um, ever want to visit us again, or uh, have your friends from Asika join uh, our meetings, you're absolutely welcome to do so. And our membership is actually very affordable. So that's a good thing too. And with that, um, next week we have uh, Joe again back from the cruise. So 
our fearless leader. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful evening and a great week. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you so all. much.